Have you heard the scepter given to Judah? In this lesson, we will learn we may never understand in this life how God accomplishes his plan. Happy Sunday. Are you missing your Sunday school? Would you like to be a part of our Sunday school? Then like, subscribe, comment, ring the bell, and you'll be notified every time I post a new video on our Sunday school lesson. We have 1,000 subscribers and counting. Thank all of you for subscribing. And it's time for a giveaway. To be a part of this giveaway, you will need to write in the comments below the word of the day. In each lesson starting today until Christmas, I will have a word of the day somewhere in the lesson. I will make it easy to see and all you need to do is watch the entire lesson and type in the word of the day below. Whoever has typed it in the most will receive the new study Bible. Now, if there is more than one person, then we will spin the wheel. But it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do this until Christmas. We do have three winners that have one. Their names are in the comments below as well. And if you are one of these winners and you haven't received your Bible, contact me so I can get it to you. Hi, I'm Regina Reed, and I teach Sunday school at Antioch Missionary Baptist Church in Maven, Mississippi. Now, let's get into this lesson. Today's lesson is the scepter given to Judah. Our background scripture is Genesis, the 35th chapter, verses 22b through 26. Genesis, 38th chapter, verses 12 through 19 and verses 24 through 26. Genesis, chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. Our devotional reading is Numbers, chapter 24, verses 2 through 9 and verses 15 through 17. And our key verse is Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. Our lesson aims. One, summarize the structure of Jacob's family. Two, explain the connections among the three sections of this lesson text. And three, state a way to overcome a family dysfunction for increased service to the Lord. Let's start with a prayer. God of Jacob and Judah, we praise you for your kingdom in Christ Jesus. Thank you for inviting us to partake in your kingdom despite our failures. Show us how we might live as citizens of your kingdom. In the name of King Jesus, we pray. Amen. In our introduction, the royal house, eight European kings or queens, trace their family back to one man, George II. King of Great Britain and Ireland, 300 years is a long time. And during that time, the king's descendants married other European royals. This made the family tree complicated. In the past, many European countries were ruled by monarchs. A monarch is a person who has power over a country like a king or a queen. Today, there are eight European countries that have monarchs who claim to have a common ancestor. This means that they believe they are all related to each other like cousins. The United Kingdom, the Netherlands, Spain, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Monaco, and Luxembourg. In the past, monarchs had a lot of power and were responsible for making many of the decisions for the country. Nowadays, monarchs still have some power, but mostly they are just ceremonial figures. For example, they might open up a new hospital or give a speech on behalf of the government. However, this week's lesson introduces a common ancestor to a royal genealogy. It's somebody who was in the royal family a long time ago and whose family members are still in the royal family today. This person has forever changed the course of history because their descendants are still ruling today. Lesson context. At the beginning of the patriarchal narratives of Genesis, God promised to make Abraham a father of many nations. 
This promise was fulfilled when Abraham's descendants became the nation of Israel. Abraham is also considered the father of the Jewish people because his grandson, Jacob, was given the name Israel. Scripture provides two primary methods of counting the tribe. The first, the first method lists tribes with an inheritance of land. And this is found in Numbers, the first chapter, verses 5 through 15, 2 through 3, and the set 32nd verse. This is also found in Joshua, the 13th through the 19th verses. Now, under this method, Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, were counted as tribes. The descendants of Levi were not included in this numbering of the 12 tribes since they were not to receive an inheritance of land. This method of listing tribes is similar to how we might list our family members. For example, we might say my grandfather's name is John and he is from the Smith family. In this case, the tribe would be listed as the Smiths and John would be the patriarch. Under this method, the descendants of Manasseh and Ephraim were instead listed as the tribe of Joseph through Jacob's family. God's promise of royalty would son Benjamin to be the ancestor of the royal line. Rather, out of Judah would come an eternal kingdom. Our lesson scriptures, we have actually three scriptures this, this week. So the first group of scriptures is Genesis 35. Is Genesis 35 chapter verses 22b through 26. Verse 22. Now the sons of Jacob were 12. God had promised Jacob, also known as Israel, in lesson three, that his descendants would be like the dust of the earth. This is found in Genesis chapter 28, verse 14, and the sand of the sea. Jacob's 12 sons and their children was God's fulfilling these promises. Verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon, and Levi, and Judah, and Iskar, and Zebulun. Jacob's sons were listed from oldest to youngest according to their respective mothers. Although Leah was Jacob's first wife, he did not intend to marry her. This is found in Genesis, the 29th chapter, verse 23 through 26. Despite her numerous sons, Leah never experienced the love from Jacob that her sister received. The scandalous behavior of Reuben, found in Genesis, the 35th chapter, verse 22, caused him to lose the firstborn privileges. His descendants would never rise to the same level of importance as would the descendants of his brothers. Simeon and Levi fell out of their family's favor because of their violence. When they heard of some bad treatment of their sister, they rescinded with violence. Judah would rise to a position of leadership among his brothers. Judah acted unrighteously at times. This is found in Genesis 38. He was uniquely blessed. Verse 24, the sons of Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. Jacob's love for Rachel was unparalleled. This is found in Genesis 29th chapter and the 30th verse. God miraculously worked to allow her to conceive Joseph. The favor that Joseph experienced from his father led his brothers to hate him. They would sell him for 20 pieces of silver. Because of the wisdom God granted him, Joseph rose to a position of leadership in Egypt. This prepared him to deal with a famine for the good of the whole known world, including his family. Jacob blessed Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, as his own. This is found in Genesis 48, chapter, verse 5. The descendants of these sons would later be counted as tribes of Israel. The youngest son of Rachel, Benjamin, received extra concern from his father. This is found in Genesis, the 42nd chapter and the fourth verse. Though Benjamin's descendants were relatively few in number, this is found in Numbers, first chapter and 36th verse, Israel's first king came from them. First Samuel, the ninth chapter and the 21st verse. Verse 25. 
and the sons of Bilhah, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtal. When Rachel was unable to conceive, she gave Bilhah to Jacob to bear his, him children. This is in Genesis, the 30th chapter in the fourth verse. Rachel named Bilhah's first child, Dan. His descendants, though many in number, were not powerful militarily. Descendants of Naphtali were admired for their valor. This is found in Judges, the fifth chapter and the 18th verse. They joined with descendants of Asher and Manasseh to drive the Midianites from the land. Verse 26. And the sons of Zilpah, Leah's handmaid, Gad and Asher, these are the sons of Jacob, which were born to him in Padaram. When Leah was unable to conceive, she allowed Jacob to continue fathering children through Zilpah. The descendants of Gad settled east of the Jordan River. This land was well suited for raising livestock. Jacob proclaimed the richness of the food produced by Asher. Found in Genesis 49th chapter in the 20th verse. Perhaps this declaration foreshadowed the tribe settlement of the fertile region of Cana. Now our scripture changes to Genesis the 38th chapter verses 24 through 26. Verse 24. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told Judah saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, had played the harlot, and also behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Now Judah sent a friend to take back his pledge, but the woman could not be found. This is Genesis the 38th chapter in the 22nd verse. Three months would pass before Judah would discover her identity. Though Tamar lived in her father's household, Judah still claimed her as part of his family. As long as his third son was alive, Judah would take an interest in her well-being, even if from a distance. Since she was widowed and lived in her father's house, there was no other way she could be with child except through immorality. Now, now I'm going to tell you a little about a little bit about who Tamar was. The oldest of Judah's sons married Tamar. His name was Ur. Ur acted wickedly and was struck dead. This is found in Genesis, the 38th chapter, verses 6 through 7. Judah directed his second son to father children with Tamar, but that son refused and was also killed. This is, all, this is found in the 38th chapter of Genesis, verse 10. With two sons dead, Judah sent Tamar to live with her father while waiting for Judah's third son to reach the age of marriage. Now, this placed the, the unimportant widow in a bad situation. She had no husband or son to care for her. Years passed. But Judah did not allow his daughter-in-law to marry his third son. This is Genesis, the 38th chapter, and verse, verse 14b, verse 25. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man whose these are, I am with child. And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose, these, who, whose are these? the signet and bracelet and staff. Tamar did not have to state publicly the extent of Judah's involvement. Instead, she forced her father-in-law to confront his hypocrisy and consider how he had failed to provide for her. This is found in Genesis 38th chapter, verse 14b. Tamar had no need to state the obvious. The personal items left behind would reveal the man who caused her to be with child. This is Genesis, the 38th chapter, verse 18. A signet was an engraved stone that would leave a unique imprint when pressed on a surface. Signets were worn as rings or could have been on bracelets or chains around Jacob's neck. 
Tamar's shrewdness revealed her intentions. She had requested and retained these items, not because of their financial value, but because of their identifying capabilities. Verse 26, and Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I, because that I gave her not to Shelah, my son. And he knew her again no more. The revealing of the personal items would have brought great shame on Judah. To his credit, he acknowledged the items and their implications regarding his own failures. Whether because of his own shame or to the, hide his immoral act, Judah turned the discussion to Tamar. His statement that she had been more righteous than I did not fully justify her. Rather, the statement indicated that Judah's behavior was relatively worse. He had acted unfaithfully and unjustly toward Tamar by preventing his son, Shelah, from marrying his widowed daughter-in-law. Tamar was in the right to want Judah to honor his obligation. She desired just treatment and forced Judah's hand so that she would receive it. But that doesn't mean that the end justified the means. That Judah knew Tamar again no more indicates that he had no further sexual relations with her. Tamar gave birth to sons. This is found in Genesis, the 38th chapter, verse 29 through 30, who would continue the line of Judah. Both Judah and Tamar were counted in a later genealogy of Jesus. And our Final scripture is Genesis, the 49th chapter, verses 10 through 12. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, Jacob's dying proclamation demonstrated his trust in the Lord's promise that kings would come from his descendants. The scepter symbolizes the presence of royalty and authority. The declaration describes Jacob's hope. A ruler would come from his descendants. This is found in Numbers, the 24th chapter, verses 17 and 19. Specifically, this ruler would come from Judah. The ruler and his kingdom would be permanent and would not depart. This prophesied individual would be in a position of leadership and authority, a lawgiver for the people, he would be so because God himself is the ultimate lawgiver. One possible reading of the text includes a mention of the city Shiloh. The city was the location of the tabernacle and the place for the administrative, for key administrative decisions. Verse 11. Binding his foal unto the vine and his ass coat unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. The king's abundance is on display through the imagery of grapevine and livestock. One can imagine that the king's abundance was so much that he would allow his foal and coat to be tied to the vine. Even if the animals ate some of the fruit of the vine, the loss would not have been an issue because of the king's bountiful and fertile crop. Verse 12, his eyes shall be red as wine and his teeth white with milk. Prosperity is further evident on the king's face. Some writers of the scripture attribute shades of red like those seen in wine of, or rubies to a person's physical vigor. White and straight teeth were a desirable physical trait. Conclusion. Promises regarding the royal descendants of Judah were fulfilled in two ways. First, they were fulfilled through the Davonic monarchy. David, a descendant of Judah, ruled Israel in power given by God. Second Samuel chapter 7, verses 5 to 15. The prophecy refers to a time when David will rule over all of Israel. And there will be peace. However, David's rule was not complete and there were still wars. The prophecy refers to a time when there will be a perfect king who will rule over a peaceful kingdom. 
The second way Judah's promises were, were fulfilled was through the promised eternal king. Second Samuel 7th chapter verses 13 through 16. Also in Jeremiah 33rd chapter verse 17 and in Psalms 45 and 6. The Old Testament prophets looked for someone who would be a good leader like a king. They thought this person would come from the family of Jesse, who was the father of King David. They believed this person would bring all people together and make them happy. The New Testament writer inter interpreted these promises to apply to Jesus. This means that they believed that the king, they believed that the things said about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament applied to Jesus. For example, in the Old Testament, Testament writers believed that this applied to Jesus. Judah and his family were by no means ideal ancestors for royalty. They were marked by rivalry, strife, and dysfunction. Judah's life in particular was filled with unrighteous acts. He was a wreck and an unlikely choice to be the ancestor of royalty. In short, God's plan for redemption is a way for us to be saved from our sin and to be transformed into better people. It's like if someone made a really big mistake and they were going to be in a lot of trouble, but then someone else stepped in and took the blame for them. That person would be redeemed. He led a dysfunctional family to become the nation of Israel. From this family would emerge the savior of the world. He turns wrecks into royals. And our thought to remember, God transforms wrecks into royals. And if you have enjoyed this lesson, remember, subscribe, comment, like, share, and use the word that you've learned in this lesson in your next week's life. Also, remember, let's love each other, take care of each other, stay six feet apart, wear your mask, get your shots, and I will see you all next week.